one of the most well-known women to have ever lived, Cleopatra's life was even more fascinating than the legend that has grown around her name. At 18, she was the queen of Egypt, and over the next two decades, she seduced and controlled two of the most powerful Roman leaders in order to retain her power. Egypt, over which Cleopatra was to rule, was conquered by Alexander the Great in 332 BCE. Upon his death nine years later, one of Alexander's generals, Ptolemy, became the ruler of Egypt. He established a dynasty that lasted for 275 years. In 81 BCE, the 12th Ptolemaic ruler, Orlates, came to the throne. Orlates had six children by two wives. With his first wife, he had three daughters, Cleopatra VI, Berenice, and Cleopatra VII. Not long after Cleopatra VII's birth, her mother died. Orlates then remarried and went on to have two sons and a daughter. Cleopatra VII and her siblings grew up in a palace complex along the shores of the Alexandria River in the capital city of Alexandria. They were attended too by hundreds of servants and had the best tutors in the land. As a result, Cleopatra received an outstanding education, becoming proficient in maths, literature, art, music, medicine, and foreign languages. As she grew into womanhood, Cleopatra came to understand that her family was full of schemers and backstabbers. She learned of the sordid dynastic history, which had involved murder and intrigue. She also learned that there were no dynastic line of succession laws in Egypt. Her father was, therefore, free to choose who, from among his children, he wanted to be the next ruler. In 65 BCE, the three most powerful generals in the Roman Empire, Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, set up a triumvirate of rulership. Under these three, Rome became more militarily powerful. Back in Egypt, Orlates recognized that it was only a matter of time before his country was invaded. He decided to forestall this eventuality by making a deal with the Romans. In 59 BCE, he offered the triumvirate a huge bribe. The money was gladly accepted, and the triumvirate agreed not to invade Egypt, at least not for the time being. The problem for Orlates was that he didn't have the money to pay the bribe and had to borrow it from a Roman money lender. To pay it back, he had to raise taxes on his people. This led to much misery and widespread starvation. In 57 BCE, the Romans invaded the Egyptian island of Cyprus. The island was ruled by Orlates' brother, but Ptolemy did nothing to save him and he was forced to commit suicide. At this, the people of Alexandria rebelled against Orlates, who fled to Rome, where he was declared a friend and ally. Back in Alexandria, Orlates' daughter, Berenice, took the opportunity to proclaim herself as Egypt's new ruler. She gained the support of many soldiers and diplomats. Then, from Rome, Orlates offered another bribe to the Romans in exchange for marching against his daughter. Leading the Roman army that marched south to defeat Berenice was a 25-year-old officer named Mark Antony. The Romans quickly routed the Egyptians and took Berenice captive. When he heard of this, Orlates ordered that she be killed. Orlates returned to Alexandria to re-establish his rule. He died in 51 BCE. He had decided that he would be succeeded by two of his children, Cleopatra VII, would rule the country with her half-brother, Ptolemy XII. At 18, Cleopatra was a few years older and much more worldly wise than Ptolemy. However, her brother had three scheming advisers who worked from the start to remove Cleopatra from the throne so that Ptolemy could be the sole ruler of Egypt. In March of 51 BCE, Cleopatra traveled up the Nile to the city of Thebes, where she participated in a ceremony to the god Amun-Re. The public reaction she received was far from encouraging, with the people having suffered under the Ptolemaic rule and her brother's advisers spreading propaganda about her. By 48 BCE, Cleopatra was fearful that the men behind her brother 
would have her killed, so she fled to Alexandria and built up a small army there. Meanwhile, back in Rome, the triumvirate was broken, and Julius Caesar established himself as the supreme leader. His former co-ruler, Pompey, raised an army and sailed with it to Egypt. There he looked to young Ptolemy to help him defeat Caesar. However, Ptolemy's advisers considered that Caesar would be the victor in the coming Roman civil war. They plotted to murder Pompey when he arrived in Egypt. Thinking that this would win Caesar's favor, soon they won Ptolemy over to this scheme. Pompey was stabbed in the back by a Roman soldier who was loyal to Ptolemy. His head was then cut off as a present for Caesar. However, when the grisly trophy was shown to Caesar, he became angry at the dishonorable manner in which his enemy had been murdered. Having brought his army to Egypt to meet Ptolemy in battle, Caesar decided to stay in Alexandria. He set himself up in the Ptolemaic palace in order to end the feud between Ptolemy and Cleopatra. Caesar ordered Ptolemy and Cleopatra to come to the palace. To do so, however, Cleopatra would have passed through the army of her brother and feared that she would be killed. So she devised a scheme to sneak her way into Alexandria. She set out in a small boat with a merchant who, after sailing into the harbor, hid her in some bedclothes. The merchant, dressed as a servant, passed by the palace guards with a bundle over his shoulder. In this way, he brought Cleopatra safely into Caesar's chamber. Caesar was fascinated by the 20-year-old Egyptian queen. He found her intelligence even more interesting than her beauty. At the time, he was married to a Roman woman named Calpurnia, yet within a few days, he and Cleopatra had become lovers. Caesar ordered brother and sister to rule Egypt co-equally. Ptolemy agreed, but was still intent on securing sole power. For her part, Cleopatra knew that she would never have peace if her half-brother was still on the scene. One of Ptolemy's key advisers, Achilles, knew that Cleopatra would remain in power so long as Caesar was on the scene. He therefore marched an army of 20,000 men on Alexandria in order to force the Roman ruler to leave. The army occupied the city and surrounded the palace. Caesar's soldiers fought in the streets as a battle raged in the harbor between Egyptian and Roman battleships. Then, more Roman troops began arriving in Egypt from Syria to attack the Egyptians from the east. Though still outnumbered, the Roman forces defeated the Egyptian troops. Ptolemy drowned in the Nile River while attempting to escape. Cleopatra was now the sole ruler, the queen of Egypt. A queen, however, needed a king, and so Caesar directed that she marry her youngest half-brother, the 12-year-old Ptolemy XIV. Caesar did not immediately return to Rome, choosing to enjoy a few months of relaxation with Cleopatra. The two lovers took a trip up the Nile on the royal barge. Caesar then returned to Rome, but left more than 50,000 troops in Alexandria to protect Cleopatra against internal enemies. In June 47 BCE, Cleopatra gave birth to Caesar's child, a boy named Caesarion. Sometime later, Caesar invited Cleopatra to Rome along with Caesarion. She moved into Caesar's palace and he had a template dedicated to the goddess Venus built in her honor, erecting a statue of Cleopatra alongside that of Venus. However, the people of Rome rejected Cleopatra as a foreigner. Caesar's elevation of Cleopatra also upset Rome's upper class, the patricians. They feared that he was turning the Roman Republic into an empire. On the Ides of March 44 BCE, more than 20 senators gathered in the Senate Hall. When Caesar entered the hall, all the senators gathered around him. Each held a knife under his cloak. At a given signal, they all ran forward and thrust their knives into Caesar's body. Within minutes, he was dead. The death of Caesar came as a shock to the people. He was quickly elevated to the status of martyr. Mobs rioted in Rome. When she learned of her lover's murder, Cleopatra realized she was in great danger. She rushed to Ostia, the port of Rome, and then sailed home. 
Soon thereafter, Ptolemy XIV was murdered. Cleopatra then named her son, Caesarion, as Ptolemy XV Caesar. Back in Rome, a new triumvirate was formed, made up of five men, including Caesar's great-nephew Octavius and Mark Antony, the general who led the invasion of Egypt years before. Antony raised an army to fight the two leading plotters against Caesar, Brutus and Cassius. In October 42 BCE, the armies of these two traitors were defeated and they both committed suicide. Mark Antony was now the most powerful general in Rome. However, it was the young, inexperienced Octavius who Caesar had named as his heir. From Egypt, Cleopatra considered that Mark Antony was likely to emerge as Rome's sole leader. She then set out to bring him under her spell. Cleopatra sailed her huge barge to Tarsus along the Cydnus River, where she knew Antony was camped with his army. She then sent word for Antony to come to the riverside and meet her. He arrived to find a woman who was going all out to seduce him. Cleopatra dressed as Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. A lavish banquet was laid on for Antony and his soldiers. Mark Antony quickly fell under Cleopatra's spell. He returned with her to Alexandria, where they carried on an ostentatious lifestyle. They also struck a bargain by which she promised to supply soldiers and money for his upcoming campaigns. After spending the winter in Alexandria, Antony returned to Rome. There he made a pact with Octavius. They would maintain the division between Eastern and Western Rome, with Antony in the East. To seal the deal, Antony married Octavius' sister, Octavia. For the next three and a half years, Cleopatra ruled Egypt alone. Because of the support she had from Antony, no foreigner dared to attack her. By 37 BCE, relations between Antony and Octavius had deteriorated to the point that civil war was threatened. While he was in Syria, preparing to go to battle against Parthia, he called for Cleopatra to join him. She rescinded immediately. It is possible that the two got married at that time. Cleopatra agreed to build a fleet of ships to support Antony's invasion of Parthia. In turn, Antony agreed to turn over most of his eastern territories to Cleopatra. These land grants caused a scandal in Rome. Most citizens believed that he had no right to give away Roman territory to a foreign queen. Antony finally invaded Parthia in 36 BCE. He made the mistake of splitting his army in two. The Parthian army attacked the slower-moving baggage train, killing thousands of Roman soldiers. The main army up ahead was forced to turn back. Without siege equipment and food supplies, they could not proceed with the invasion. During the retreat, the army was hit by sudden attacks, disease and famine, with thousands more dying. The campaign ended in abject failure. In January of 35 BCE, Cleopatra traveled to Syria to meet her defeated lover. Later that year, they returned to Egypt. Octavius sent a message for Antony to return to Rome, but he refused to do so. He then effectively set himself up as the king of Egypt, alongside his queen. Back in Rome, Octavius painted him as a traitor to the Republic. In 33 BCE, Antony and Cleopatra settled in Ephesus, a city in Asia Minor. From there, Antony gathered an army of more than 100,000 men. In Rome, Octavius also prepared for battle. The showdown came at the Battle of Actium. This was a naval battle which took place on the Ionian Sea. Initially, the combined fleets of Antony and Cleopatra trapped Octavius's fleet in a blockade, but then they broke free and began to get the upper hand. Octavius's ships were smaller, allowing them to get into position quicker. They rammed the Egyptian ships over and over. Then a massive storm wind blew. It pushed the ships directly towards Egypt. The ships of Antony and Cleopatra proceeded to escape. The rest of Antony's fleet fought on into the night. By morning, his ships had either been sunk or had retreated. Antony and Cleopatra sailed to Egypt 
By now, Antony was a broken man, having lost another major battle and most of the soldiers had deserted him. For three years, the couple were given breathing space. Then, in the spring of 30 BCE, Octavius marched his army to Alexandria to finish them off once and for all. A desperate Antony sent a message to Octavius asking that he be allowed to live in Alexandria as a private citizen with no rank of Roman privileges. Octavius refused. In a state of depression, Antony then built a small house near the Pharos lighthouse where he lived alone. Meanwhile, Cleopatra sent gifts to Octavius and asked that he let her live. Her gifts were accepted, but her offer was also refused. On August 1st, 30 BCE, Antony's naval fleet and cavalry surrendered to Octavius. At this news, Cleopatra hid herself in her tomb and had a message sent to Antony that she had committed suicide. A grief-stricken Antony responded by stabbing himself in the stomach. It was soon discovered by his friends that his love was still alive and a badly wounded Antony was taken to Cleopatra's tomb where he died in her arms. Before Cleopatra had time to follow Mark Antony's example, her tomb was infiltrated by one of Octavius's men and she was taken into custody. When she was presented to Octavius, she told him defiantly, I will not be led in a triumph. He agreed, but days later, she heard that he was actually planning to have her and her three children paraded through the streets of Rome in chains. This she could not stand. On August 10th, 30 BCE, 39-year-old Cleopatra took her own life. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe. If you have any other suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover, please leave a comment below. And we'll see you next time on History Junkie.